There you go. Hey, folks, and uh, welcome back to this uh, ng-conf webinar. My name is Adi, and I'm going to be your host. But today, I have the pleasure. I mean, we do have, as a community, the pleasure of welcoming Alisa Duncan, one of my favorite speakers. You know, I know some people are going to be jealous. Sorry, I just have to say it. And then real quick, you know, Alisa is a senior developer advocate at Okta. Uh, she's a full stack developer and a community builder. She loves the thrill of learning new things. She's a Google developer expert in Angular and then has the Angular KC meetup team. In, it's part of the core team of NG Girls and help lead an organization that teaches women web development basics. When not coding or volunteering, she enjoys cooking, watching K-dramas. You're going to have to tell me what K-drama are and drinking a glass of wine. Uh, she's a little under the weather, but she still like insisted that she needs to, she she already committed to this. So let's be kind to her and be patient with her. Alisa, today you're going to be talking about safety first. So without further ado, Alisa, uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Ade. That's really awesome. Um, let's see. I hope I said your name right. Okay, so I am going you're to good, get yes. all right. I'm going to get started. So today we're going to talk about staying safe and secure with Angular. Yes, this is a web security talk. So I know it's going to keep everybody on the edge of their seats because we all love web security, right? If you saw my ng-conf 2022 talk about web safety in Angular, you're going to see a lot of overlaps with this presentation. That's because at a high level, a lot of topics are the same. But what we're going to do today is go into a little bit more breadth and a lot more depth on some of the topics that I wasn't really able to get into deeply um, during that uh, uh, ng-conf talk. And we're going to cover best practices as well as common pitfalls that you might encounter as an Angular dev. And if you did see that ng-conf 2022 talk, no problems, because we're going to really, you're going to get a lot more today, and you're going to have all that plus extras. So you might be wondering why I have a picture of a goose as my cover page here on this on my slides. Well, that's because if you've interacted with geese, I think you'd know that they're pretty fearsome and I haven't met any fearsome, any more fearsome creature than a goose protecting their young with a gosling. And I feel like that's what Angular does for us. It really helps make sure that we are as safe as can be and well protected and well guarded. So let me tell you about how that all works, starting with a horror scenario and why we need to apply security first mindset to our application. And we'll start with that, a tale of security woes. Let's say that you're a fan of K-dramas and you work on a K-drama fan site. On this fan site, you can navigate to an individual K-drama to add comments, which you do. And when you're there, you see that awful comments are already written in your name and you know you're not the one who added them. Oh no, what do we do? How do we stop this from happening to other K-drama fans? Well, we need to make sure that we're integrating web security best practices throughout our application process. And this is from the ground up. So even before the development process, really. So <clears throat> what we need to do is make sure that we are thinking about web security and applying it within our development process as well, because web vulnerabilities are a risk to our assets. And those assets include our application, our data, our users and their data, as well as, <clears throat> as well as to the organization itself. So that includes your reputation of the organization, the brand, and the bottom line, which adds up to liability. And that is a big, scary word for C-suite type folks and web defense teams. And so we as develop web developers have to make sure that we are doing what we can to build in security into our applications. And I'm Elisa Duncan. I'm a senior developer advocate at Okta and Angular GDE, and I am a K-drama fan. You can find me on a sort of social channels at Elisa Duncan. Well, I'd be remiss talking about web security if I don't mention the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP. This group finds web vulnerabilities, categorizes them, and then creates a list based off of impact and incidences. And they they periodically released this list most recently in 2021 as the OWASP top 10. Since these are a list of web vulnerabilities, we as web developers should have knowledge about everything that's on here. But today we're gonna to focus on four of the items that commonly affect Angular developers and applications. That is the number one category broken access control, 
the number three category injection, the number six category vulnerable and outdated components, and the number seven category identification and authentication failures. So what I'm gonna do for each one of those topics is to cover how the vulnerabilities in those categories works, how Angular protects you and what, and what is built into Angular itself, and then what extra steps you might need to make to mitigate any sort of uh, um, risks in that category. We'll start first with perhaps the most boring in the group, at least maybe I think it's boring, but it's so important. It's like flossing your teeth, boring but important. It's vulnerable and outdated components. So let me ask you this, what version of Angular are you running? Does that question maybe make you cringe a little bit? And you know, it's okay, I get it. We're enterprise developers and that means that sometimes we're not able to take the latest and greatest versions of things just at the drop of a hat, right? There's a process for that. And even though Angular itself is a pretty safe framework, there are security updates and improvements that happen in the framework across time. So we do have to keep Angular up to date. It is something that's important to make sure we are keeping our dependencies uh, secure. Luckily for us, Angular CLI has the ng update command, very handy dandy tool that we could use to run updates on the Angular core libraries, as well as any libraries within the Angular ecosystem that has update schematics. But, what about other dependencies, right? Because our complex applications have more than just Angular and perhaps even some Angular ecosystem libraries in there. It's a lot more than that. Yes, we do have to worry about these as well. So we need to keep all of our dependencies up to date, but not just the willy nilly latest and latest and greatest all the time. What we're specifically wanting to make sure we're handling are known vulnerabilities or CVEs. Those are common vulnerabilities and exposures. And you really need to watch out for those and make sure that you take a fix for a dependency when this occurs. Now, how do you know that that's a problem, right? Because not all CVEs get the press attention of some. For example, the log for shell uh, vulnerability that hit end of 2021 that affected log4j libraries and a lot and the you know, Java applications, the impact was humongous for that. And so it got a lot of press coverage, but that's not what's gonna happen for all the dependencies that we use. So we need some tools to help us out. We can sign ourselves up to get spammed by Dependabot, that is one option. And you can check specifically for security, uh, security risks, right, in your dependencies. And that's a good thing to look out for. There's also other OSS dependency scanning tools if you are not on GitHub or don't wanna use Dependapod in that way. These OSS dependency scanning tools include tools that are from the OWASP group themselves. So you can add that to the very minimum to your CI CD pipeline. And if you can't use OSS tools because your you know, company requires that it can't um, or you need some more value add, there's of course paid tools out there as well that will do this for you. But either way, you do need to keep aware of what's out there in the landscape and make sure that you are not depending on a library that is vulnerable or outdated or unmaintained as well. So with that public safety announcement out of the way, we can move on to our next category. And this one is a big one for uh, uh, web developers. It's injection, which includes cross-site scripting. And cross-site scripting occurs when there's not good data and code boundaries and values. And we take these polluted values and incorporate them into our application, which allows attackers to perform unauthorized actions. So an example cross-site scripting attack could look like this. We go back to our Kdrama fan site, you go to an individual K-drama to add those comments. Now, the hope is that whenever people come and visit the website, that they'll add comments that are in plain text and be very, very sweet. But you know, that's not what happens. You know, there's always that jerk and somebody adds a comment like this, where they're taking, trying to take advantage of a vulnerability by showing an alert when somebody clicks a link. So this vulnerability or this comment is added to the Kdrama fan site and saved to the database. The next time an unsuspecting Kdrama fan arrives at the site, they see that link for free prizes. And honestly, who isn't tempted to click on a link for free prizes, right? We all are. So they do, and then they get this JavaScript alert that says, yikes. 
Fortunately, a JavaScript alert is startling, but not dangerous because nothing really happened other than maybe being, you know, seeing this yikes alert. But the precedent that it sets is incredibly dangerous because once an attacker is able to successfully run their script inside your application, they can impersonate you, perform unauthorized actions, read and capture sensitive data, including your login credentials, even run malware against your machine. I happen to think that Kirama fan sites are very, very critical. However, I can see that maybe the organizations we work at think that the applications that, that they you know, have uh, perhaps at least match in criticality. I can give it that match. So consider what happens if the application you work on is a financial institution or healthcare or government, right? Now we're talking about some really serious trouble. And consider what happens when the attack user has elevated access within the, uh, that application, which means now they're able to view even more sensitive data or run even more impactful actions. Uh-oh. This is now really scary times. So we need to watch out for cross-site scripting anytime there's poor data hygiene. That is when we're not properly escaping and sanitizing values before using it. And anytime we add untrusted data into our application using injection sinks. Now, fortunately for us, Angular is a highly suspicious sort, just like that goose, and treats all values as untrusted, which means that it handles that data hygiene for us. So without any effort on our part, we have security when every time we use Angular. Because Angular escapes values anytime we're incorporating that into our application using interpolation. So if we add our comments via interpolation like this, even if that comment is a purposely broken image that runs a script upon error, if we view that comment in our application when it's using interpolation, we're gonna see that comment just as is in plain text. And it also makes the original poster look a little silly if you ask me. We can furthermore verify that that is indeed escaped plain text, nothing for the browser to interpret by inspecting it in DevTools, which it is. So we are safe when we have interpolation. Angular also sanitizes values anytime we property bind to injection or to sinks. So these injection sinks are web API functions that allow us to create the dynamic content that we all expect today in our applications. And it includes methods that append to the DOM, such as the inner HTML, approaches the load external resources, that is an image source, an anchor tags href, or even a styles URL, and event handlers. So if we incorporate our comments by property binding to the inner HTML attribute of this paragraph tag, what we'll see for that broken image comment is a broken image. And if we inspect in DevTools though, we're gonna see that that error handler is no longer in the DOM. And we'll see a warning that Angular has sanitized some HTML and removed some content. But let's take a peek under the covers of Angular's code and see how this all works. Angular maintains lists of safe elements and attributes. These are allow lists that it uses to make sure that everything matches for security. So after Angular builds out the tree that is the view, it then traverses through the tree and inspects every element and attribute in there and verifies that we are safe. So if we take a look at the code where Angular is doing this, it looks like a lot, right? So don't worry, we're not gonna look at this. We're gonna condense it down. And let's take a look at the parts that we're particularly interested in and leave out all that tedious work. We're interested in the list of valid elements, list of valid attributes, and then also there's attributes that explicitly require sanitization. So I think the best way to do this is to walk through an example and see how the, that code that we just skipped would apply to this. First, it'll take a look at that element image. And now image is a safe void element. And therefore, it is safe and allowed to be retained. And we could be now evaluating the rest of the attributes in this element. Next, it moves on to source. Now, source is an attribute that explicitly requires sanitization. But in our case, there's nothing to sanitize because really there's really nothing in the value, right? So it's safe and is allowed to be retained. This is what makes the image element a valid HTML element. And that's why we see a broken image in the application. Next, it moves to the on error. 
attribute. Now the on error attribute is not a safe attribute and that's why it's removed. If we change our exploit to another previous example that we talked about, which was that free prizes here link, if we view this in our application, we see that link for free prizes. And if we inspect DevTools, we see the anchor tag with the href of unsafe colon JavaScript alert. And we also see the warning that Angular has sanitized an unsafe URL value. URLs explicitly require sanitization and they follow a regex pattern to match for safety. So when it does that explicit sanitization, it checks that regex, identifies that it is indeed unsafe, which is absolutely true. And that's why we see that console warning pop up and where Angular prepends the unsafe colon to the URL, which makes it so the browser is no longer able to interpret that and nothing happens when you click on the link and therefore we're safe. Angular also allows safe markup, which is really helpful if you have like a rich text editor that you want to incorporate into your application. So if you wanted to allow the comment, it's a wonderful drama, the best in strong font, we can view that in strong font in the application because strong is a valid inline element. Now, the example that I gave is a particular form of a cross-site scripting attack, and it's called stored cross-site scripting. But in reality, cross-site scripting attacks can take on a, lot of whole, a whole lot of different forms, and some of it can be pretty sneaky. So protecting against each one of those is going to be really hard to do. Fortunately, Angular has our back on one of the sneaky ones which includes mutation cross-site scripting. This is when HTML that was formerly inert, that is safe, becomes unsafe through the process of the browser parsing the markup. Now this might happen because browsers will autocorrect things for us and attackers will try to take advantage of that. Now how Angular helps us out is by repeatedly checking the stability of that HTML throughout that markup parsing process to make sure that we are safe at the very end. So it's checking all those elements and attributes for us, making sure that the final rendered product is indeed safe for us to use. Isn't that super thorough and handy? So as you can see, Angular has constructs with a uh, built-in security when we use um, property binding and interpolation. And it handles that escaping and sanitizing for us through its data hygiene process. So you always want to use Angular constructs anytime you can, because when you do, you really do have the most amount of safety. That said, there is a mechanism to bypass Angular security and to walk away from um, the security mechanisms that Angular has. And when you do this, though, you are entering some really dangerous territory because you're not getting that built-in security checks that Angular has for us, right? However, there might be some genuine needs to do so, like when you really need to have video trailers in your KDRAMA application. So what we need to do in this case is we need to bind a trusted video link to an iframe. That's where we have the embedded video player. Now notice I'm saying trusted. This is really important because we are stepping away from Angular's built-in security mechanisms. We have to make sure that we are limiting our risk and really trying to make sure that we are using as trustworthy of information and data as possible. So if we brought this into a component, what we're first gonna do is to form that safe link. And we'll do so by uh, starting with that video ID. Now this might be something, I have it hard coded here, but this might be something that's passed in from the parent component or maybe it comes in from a URL parameter or uh, even user input someplace else. I'm not quite sure, but either way, it's untrusted, right? Because you don't know where it's come from and what that value is. So what you need to do is you need to validate that it is the format and the type that you're expecting. So if you're expecting a, a bunch of numbers here, make sure that all you have is a bunch of numbers. If you're expecting that you're gonna have uh, two characters, two alpha characters and three numbers like I have here, ensure that it is. You want to limit that risk and make sure that you're not allowing anything that can come in that could cause any problems. Then we can form that safe link by appending it to a trusted video source. Now notice that I'm saying trusted video host, right? Because we're defining what that trusted area is. We're not allowing anybody else to pass that into us. 
Once again, we want to limit that attack surface and make sure that we're staying as safe as possible when we have to bypass security. Now, to get on to the bypassing part, what we're going to do is inject the DOM sanitizer. And the DOM sanitizer has these methods, bypass security trust, for different types of values that we want to work with. In this case, it's a resource URL. And this returns a safe type of value we're using, which is a safe resource URL. And this is what signifies Angular to, uh, to skip that sanitization process and to bind it to the iframe source so we can see those videos. And the reason we have to do this um, in the case of this video um, embed is that resource URLs can contain, legitimately contain uh, bits of code and Angular can't sanitize it. So this is an area where we do have to bypass security in order to get this to work. Now I mentioned types of values a few times. So what those really are, are security contexts of which Angular defines five of them. And that's because cross-site scripting is contextual, meaning that the way that you um, sanitize, I'm sorry, sanitizing code is contextual, meaning the way that you sanitize a particular value will depend on what you're using that value for. So Angular defines HTML, style, script, URL, and resource URL as those contexts that it supports. So if we see the DOM sanitizer methods, we see that there's a bypass security trust for each one of those security contexts, because we have to let Angular know exactly how to handle a particular value, what it's doing, right? It can't figure it out on its own. We have to provide that context. It also has an explicit sanitize value or sanitize method that takes the security context as a parameter. This is where we have to let it know, once again, which context to use for that sanitization code. Now that I've talked about security context and explicit sanitization and needing to pass in the context to use, you might wonder how did we how did we handle the property binding earlier with the inner HTML and not define that security context? Well, it's because Angular has automatic sanitization built in, meaning that it tracks which security context to use based off the attribute that you are binding to. So if we take a look at Angular's code, we see that there's maps. Where it's mapping out these different security contexts with different elements and attributes of which inner HTML is one. The bypassing security, that are by, those bypass security methods aren't the only way that you can get yourself in danger here. There's some other dangerous practices to be aware of. You need to watch out for any time you're concatenating strings to create templates. That is, you're working outside the bounds of Angular constructs and Angular uh, templates, right? When you do this, you are circumventing Angular security processes, and you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. This might happen if you're having a server-side um, rendering, um, like templating engine, provide back what you want your HTML to be, that's a possibility, right, in terms of, uh, of how you might get into this. Another option um, that you might run into and cause yourself some woes is by manually constructing DOM elements. Now, when you do this once again, you are circumventing Angular's security mechanisms. So if we take a look at the example of this broken, purposely broken image, and try bringing it into a component where we're doing this, let's say that we have an element ref and we're gonna try using the DOM APIs directly. And we have this comment from some source, comes from the server or whatever it might be. If you tried just setting the value to the inner HTML of that element ref using the DOM APIs, that's one way. And another way is even using the render, right? Because you're still doing the same thing. You're still bypassing or circumventing Angular security mechanisms and manually building the DOM yourself. In both cases, what you're gonna see in the application is the broken image, as well as that on error handler actually show up in the rendered product. And yeah, you're gonna get booed. That's what's gonna happen. And we don't want that to happen, right? We wanna avoid that. A better option is to, in the same scenario, explicitly call a sanitized method that you pass in that context for. When you do this, at least you have it sanitized. Of course, if you can avoid doing this and use property binding interpolation, you should instead, but this is an option in the case there is no other option for you. Just remember though, 
with great power comes great responsibility. Just because you can bypass angular security mechanisms or circumvent it doesn't mean you should. You definitely shouldn't. If you did have to do that, though, make sure you get a security audit because you really are entering this in dangerous territory here. And always, always, always use Angular constructs. I don't know if you heard this earlier, but it's really important to do because you really do have the most amount of security when you do this. Additionally, some tips to stay safer when it comes to cross-site scripting include using AOT compilation. And this actually goes back to that first uh, OWASP number six uh, uh, vulnerability and uh, outdated components, vulnerable, not, but, uh, vulnerable and outdated components is that uh, uh, AOT compilation became default in Angular V8, right? So if you are on V8 or higher, then you should, or started on V8 or higher, then you should have AOT compilation built in and you should take advantage of it. The reason you want AOT compilation is because it builds in those security checks at compile time instead of at runtime, like what JIT does. And so you do have more security as a result. Now, I understand that some of us started our Angular application is pre-V8, right? And we've upgraded over time and we haven't maybe taken the opportunity to make sure we change everything over to using AOT. And I encourage you to do so um, because you will have more built-in security mechanisms when you do. Additionally, you can also make sure that you're enabling content security policies, those are CSPs, on your production server that serves the Angular application. And you want to keep those policies as strict as possible because you want to avoid loading any rogue resources. You want to keep things just as, as strict and tight as possible and make sure that you're not allowing any shenanigans to get through. And additionally, thinking of CSPs, there's also this this uh, type called trusted types that you can add on, which is supposed to be the way to really handle cross-site scripting attacks, including those sneaky ones, once and for all. And Angular has support for those trusted type policies if you want to use it. So the policies that it supports include if you just have a straight old regular old Angular app, if you have any lazy loaded modules within your Angular app, or if you have to bypass security, or if you use JIT. In all those four cases, you have Angular provides these trusted type policies that we could use ready to go. The problem with trusted types is browser support. It is supported across Chromium browsers, but it's not fully available across all browsers yet, although I've heard there's a poly field that you might be able to explore. If you can get away with using trusted types, either through only supporting those supported browsers or um, the polyfills work for you, that's fantastic. You really should explore that. But if you can't, which might be the most of us right now, uh, we'll have to wait for, uh, for more support to roll out before we can really embrace trusted types. Next, let's move on to the number seven uh, OWASP category, identification and authentication failures. Now this includes preventing authentication related attacks. So what you want to do is make sure that you're defending against automated attacks that try to gain access. And this includes preventing against bots and preventing against any sort of like brute force mechanisms that people might try to use to gain access. And so what we want to do is make sure we're employing really strong credential management processes. I feel like this calls for a throwback to a classic XKCD where it is making fun of password policies, right? We've optimized for passwords that are hard for us humans to remember, easy for computers to crack. And instead we should be optimizing for the opposite where it is harder for computers to crack, but much easier for us to remember because it's a nice long phrase like correct horse battery staple. It's a fantastic phrase, easy to remember. Don't recommend using that though, because I'm sure it's on some password top 100 lists, right? But that idea of making sure that you're really thinking about how to make things more difficult to gain access. And you want to use authentication best practices, which might be different for the systems that you are using. And you know, it might change, right? In general, though, if you can, you want to use OpenID Connect as a standard for handling authentication. For most of us, though, we probably need to have authorization as well. And we'll talk about authorization in the next 
and why that's useful in the next uh, section. So we're looking at OAuth2 plus OpenID Connector, IDC. This combination gives us both authentication and authorization, and it is really like best in class um, a way to make sure that we are protecting our application from uh, nefarious sorts gaining entry. And talking about those passwords previously with that XKCD, maybe passwords aren't enough, right? Maybe you need to explore elevation of that, like really elevating it up. You need to maybe look at multi-factor or other phishing resistant factors to incorporate, including uh, in addition or in place of passwords. As a matter of fact, uh, I was reading some stuff about um, the US government uh, cybersecurity reports and they're calling passwords pre-breached, which means that it's just gonna happen. Like it is, they're expecting that that will get cracked. So it's really not a safe way to go. Depending on your application, you may need more than passwords. It may not be recommended at all. So for Angular, we talk about OAuth and uh, OIDC. At least take a step back, OAuth, OIDC, they have different flows, right? And previously, the recommended OAuth flow for Angular applications was called implicit flow. Now, implicit flow was recommended at a time when browsers had some limitations, and it uh, um, it wasn't really what what the OAuth committee wanted it to be as a recommendation for. But it had they had no choice based off of browser limitations. But that has changed. Browsers have evolved, and therefore, implicit flow is no longer recommended as the OAuth flow to use. Instead. Angular applications should be using something called authorization code flow with a proof key for code exchange extension or Pixie. And if you use refresh tokens, you also need to employ something called refresh token rotation. This is where your refresh token is ensuring that it's getting the latest versions of your auth tokens, almost like with every call, to really limit the the scope of what might happen if somebody is able to intercept your token and use it, right? Because it's only a, that accesses that uh, authorization token is only useful for a very short period of time with the refresh token rotation mechanism. But doesn't that sound like a lot? I mean, how do you keep up with that? How do you deal with that? Well, I recommend you don't. Make it somebody else's problem. And I'm not even kidding. Seriously, you really should. Because good authentication is really, really hard to do. So you want to use a reputable identity provider. And that might include uh, you know, paid sources as well as open source uh, options, right? They have them. Either way, what you want to do is use an identity provider that is uh, OIDC certified. And you definitely, definitely, definitely don't want to roll your own and deal with that yourself. Because let's face it, we're going to mess it up. This is this is somebody's full-time job. I and mean, this can't be our full-time job if we're also trying to deliver features, right? So don't do it. And on the Angular side, now you need to have this connection to these identity providers. Fortunately for us, we have two OIDC certified libraries that we can choose from in the Angular ecosystem. And that includes Angular Auth OIDC client and Angular OAuth 2 OIDC, both which work great. So we have the built-in support in our you know, Angular family to be able to handle these authentication best practices, which is awesome. Next, let's talk about the number one OWASP uh, category, broken access control. And this includes cross-site request forgery, which occurs when applications share session keys to untrusted sources. Now, an example CSR of attack looks like this. Let's say that you're doing some online banking and your bank uses cookies to manage sessions. Next, you check your emails and you come across this kind of fishy email, but you're so tempted and you click the link and you know what? No judgment, we all have done that before. Nobody's immune from clicking fishy links. Unfortunately though, the sender of this email is an attacker that's targeting your bank because your bank has some dubious security practices. So you click on the link and you're taken to a malicious site and that malicious site has a hidden form that makes a form post back to your bank and ask for a money transfer. Now, because your cookie didn't, or because your bank didn't protect their cookies and you have that active session cookie, you pass that session cookie directly to the malicious site, which then forwarded it to the bank. 
And because your bank doesn't verify the authenticity of this request, it allows this transfer to go through, which means that that attacker is able to walk away with your money. That's not good. So there's some mitigation strategies that we can employ here. One is to use built-in browser capabilities and protect our cookies. This is something that the backend should have provided or the bank should have provided in their cookie, right? They should have added like the same site attribute to the cookie, for example, and there's more that they could do. Above and beyond that, you also have an option to exchange a CSR of token between the front and the back end. Now, how this works is the back end will create a CSR of token cookie. It's a special cookie just for this, and it passes it to the front end. Now, when the front end makes any subsequent calls to the back end, it'll take the value of that token, and it will, in addition to sending that token back, it'll also take that value and put it into a secondary source. Now, the server side then has to verify the authenticity of this request by making sure that those tokens and values match. There is backend work to do in this mitigation strategy, which is also known as the double submit cookie pattern. Now, how Angular helps is that it has support for the double submit cookie pattern directly available as the HTTP client XSR module. So if we incorporate that within our application, it automatically sends that CSR of token value back as an API header that the backend can verify. We take a look at the module definition. We see that it provides the HTTP client uh, XSR, or HTTP XSR interceptor. This interceptor is how it grabs that cookie token value and uh, properly appends it uh, as a HTTP header to outgoing calls so that your backend can do that verification. Very, very handy. Now, the bulk of the OWASP uh, number one uh, broken access control category includes the handling the access to elevation of privilege. Now, this is when somebody who doesn't have the privilege levels that they should is able to view things that they shouldn't or is able to perform actions that they shouldn't. And in this case, there's active work that we need to do to add these access control checks. This is not something that Angular can provide because every system is different. But what Angular does provide are building blocks that we could use to implement those access controls. Those building blocks include route guards, and these can help prevent unauthorized access to routes. We have can activate, can activate child, and the newly deprecated can load to prevent loading a route, as well as the new can match guard for preventing a route from even matching at all and acting like it doesn't even exist. So depending on what your system's need are, you could use one or many of these, uh, these route guards. Additionally, you can, you can add those route guards to lazy loaded modules or to uh, which are feature modules or to even feature routes if you're using you know, modulus architecture to make sure that you are protecting like that route and child routes and things all at once, right? The way you organize your application, uh, whether you're using modules or not, could be really enhanced by adding um, route guards to make sure that you have those access control checks. You can also use structural directives to help manage the conditional uh, visibility conditional elements on templates. And that could depend on a user's access level. So you could use the out of the box ng if as an example. Let's say you want to check for whether they're authenticated or what their role is. Or you can also create your own custom structural directive if you want. Here in this example, I created a custom structural directive to check for K-drama superfans and pass in the user's group so that K-drama superfans get a special greeting um, if they are one. Additionally, you can also use interceptors to manipulate HTTP calls for, that your system might need. An example of this is adding the authorization header to your outgoing requests. And to do so, you might create a auth interceptor. What you want to do, though, is make sure that you are protecting your auth tokens, right? You don't want it to get out and leak out to uh, bad sorts. So you want to make sure that you are only adding that auth header to allowed origins and use an allow list of which ones, uh, which origins that you're, you should be adding that auth header to. So hopefully you can see Angular keeps us safe and secure. Now I'm not calling all of us a bunch of clowns and clownfish, but it kind of feels we are because Angular is like the sea anemone fortress that helps us out. 
you can learn more on a, I have like a four, four uh, series post about SPA web security. You can check out. I also have all the code from this project uh, in a uh, repo in GitHub. And I also have these slides posted online along with that QR code that will get you back to these resources. And I highly recommend checking out uh, Angular security docs because there's a lot of great information in there. And feel free to reach out to me after this webinar uh, if you have any questions at Elisa Duncan. I'd love to chat with you. I'd love to meet members of the NG fam. I'd love to hear about any K-drama recommendations you have. And I know I had to skip through uh, several sections pretty quickly and uh, particularly that OAuth section I feel bad about, but um, feel free to hit me up. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. That. I'm going to stop sharing. Yes. Oh my. Oh my. <laughs> I mean, this this is just a masterclass. It's like uh, security is something that is certainly in the back of a lot of people' uh, mind when you're developing um, an application. But usually, unfortunately, like you know, we worried about the security like when it is a little too late, like when something finally happens. And that's right. where we're like, oh my, that I should have thought about this and everything like that. But it's kind of very cool that Angular has all these like uh, guardrails in place. Now it's up to us to use them like the right way, you know, and um, take take care of that. So there's a few questions in um, in the Q&A, but before all of that, thank you so much for like, you know, uh, trekking through. I know you're not feeling so well today, but we could not tell. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Uh, one of the very first like question we had is from Cicero and uh, asking, would interpolation also work for emojis? Yes, I'm pretty sure it does. Um, at least I think I did that uh, in my samples. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure it does. All right. So to, to be continued, we will double check and um, uh, yeah. where and uh, where I mean in the meantime, where people can find you um, um, to to keep this conversation going. Just before we get to the next question, yeah, you can um, you can find me. Uh, probably the best way is uh, at Elisa Duncan um, on Twitter. On Twitter, yeah, yeah. You can cool. also feel free to check out like that uh, GitHub uh, sample, and I'll put I'll post those links in the chat. Um, and if it's not, if there's not emojis already in there as interpolation, then it, I have an example with interpolation, just add one, right? And double check. All right. It, so. We'll make sure that we add all those resources when this is going to be published anyway. So yeah, good. So the next question is, is there any list of possible SSS attacks somewhere to help testing and make sure that we take care of it? Like kind of like, is there a, um, um, uh, a checklist somewhere that somebody can refer to? In, in general, yeah. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I did not touch upon testing. I don't know if there is like a full list of XSS attacks, um, just like as is. There might be. Um, there's definitely resources available on OWASP's uh, website that might mm -hmm. have that listed. But I think better than like a list and comparing it, I think there are some other tools that I might recommend. One of them is uh, another OWASP um, developer tooling set that they have. It's called, um, I think it's like OWASP Zap. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a verification tester that can help test your application for security um, checks. So I'd recommend using that instead of worrying about every particular form of cross-site scripting because there's a lot and it's pretty sneaky, as I said. So you might try looking at that. And then additionally, um, there's recommendations on, um, on testing, also from the OWASP group. They're, it's called um, OWASP Application Security Verification Standards, ASVS. Mm -hmm. And they walk through how you would test and the sort of the things that you'd want to look for. And I recommend checking that out as well. Nice, yeah, so, um, and, um... I guess one of the last, I mean, that's that's one of the most, security is something that like you have to keep on. Uh, there, there's always something new coming and stuff like that. How do you keep abreast of that? I mean, is that 
Do you just trust an entity to do that for you? How do you keep yourself educated? What are what is what is the balance there? How much do you think that you personally need to be involved as like a responsible developer? Or should you like uh, focus more on like finding the right entity and just delegated it to them? Well, I think that if you first, I should I should point out that um, you don't want to find an entity and delegate anything after development because that's too late, right? As we just talked yeah. about. Um, yeah, exactly. You need to start before that. You need to actually start like in the requirements phase. It starts from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but if you do, if you're a large enough organization that can support a um, like a security team, that is definitely a help to have, right? And um, you, will you will need to do your own work, but having their support will be helpful. Um, for the rest of us who don't have that, yeah, that's a really good question because we're now juggling quite a bit of things, right? Um, not just getting features out the door, but also making sure that we're doing so safely. I would recommend, um, once again, leaning back on OWASP, they're really a fantastic, fantastic group with great resources. Mm -hmm. They have something called um, cheat sheets that are perfect for developers to read about and make sure that they are understanding the security landscape and apply. And like, it talks about how, like how to apply it for developers. It is for developers, right? So there's mm -hmm. actually OWASP cheat sheets as well as um, OWASP proactive controls. Both are specifically for developers to understand and learn about. And so that's a great place to uh, keep up with things. I think the one place where I'd truly, truly would recommend that you really delegate it to somebody else is that authentication because it is tough stuff, you know? And especially if you need to add in um, extra factors or phishing resistant factors, you don't wanna have to deal with that, you know, biometrics or extra things yourself. You just wanna allow your identity provider to just handle it for you because it could just, it's configurable. So you mm -hmm. want to be able to, to do that. You don't want to roll your own. All right. Very good points there. And uh, we have Anel who's asking, do you have any recommended company providers uh, that will handle the security audit for an application, for example? I don't have one in particular. I know that there's multiple um, mm -hmm. that exist. And uh, like I know, I know uh, Okta uses at least one or two of different ones, mm -hmm. maybe more. Um, in addition to having their own team. So I, I think it's just really a matter of um, just finding a provider that works for your organization and uh, using somebody reputable. I, I think like another way to look at this question too, like what is a security threshold? When we're looking at security and we're saying security audit, is there anything as like just secure enough, too secure or not secure enough? Is there a threshold where we like, ah, uh, you are a little like, but if you were to do like, what what is a security audit and what is a security threshold? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I think the answer, as it is with every development question, is it depends. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah, the family it depends. <laughs> it depends because it depends on the type of application that you're working on and mm -hmm. what that impact is. So if you are if you're writing a K-drama fan site, which really mm -hmm. is the pinnacle, let's be honest, it's you might just only need basic security and authentication. That's it, right? But if you're now looking at something that works with healthcare or B2B apps, now you might have a higher threshold that you need to meet. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you are working on applications that's critical infrastructure, government, things like that, higher yet, right? So mm -hmm. it really depends on your application and the um, and like the criticality of it and mm -hmm. the impact that it might have. Um, once again, I'm going to refer back to OWASP. There's like this whole set of analysis on that. Mm -hmm. and what you do need to go from a design standpoint, um, like mapped out on on a OWASP website called a um, it's security application maturity model. And you mm -hmm. can pick from level one through level three, depending on what you need for different aspects of uh, the software development lifecycle. Okay. That is pretty cool. So like when you are talking about a different threshold, we that's when you get into like the different type of compliance. Like I think health, mm -hmm. they have HIPAA in there to protect like uh, user data. 
and then and so forth and so on. Now, um, uh, the the front end side of like the security, what does it have to do, or is it just a complement of other aspects of security? Like, what level of encryption do you have? What level? What uh, 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 did you protect your servers? Yeah, what what is what is that ecosystem like? That 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 is security. Because if the front end developer, a front end developer extraordinaire like me, did everything that I needed to do. And my backend developer, like uh, I don't know, Jordan Powell did not do his 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 job. I mean, oh, what burn. is what is, <laughs> I'm gonna burn him this time. He's not here, so I'm gonna burn him. <laughs> no, guys, Jordan is the best. I'm the one yeah. probably who's gonna be messing it up. But what is what is what is actually the security responsibility? Is that at at the at the uh, at a different like department level? Uh, is that a whole like you know what 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 is security? If if we really go to the bottom, because we talk a lot. To people who don't have like uh, uh, the decision makers might not have, you know, the technical savvy, but nobody wants to pay that costly bill when you have a, a site or an application that is not secure anymore. Yeah, that is a really, really good point. Now, security is holistic of your entire application, right? Mm -hmm. That includes hosting, that includes the build process, that includes everything. Right. So mm -hmm. it's while I focused on Angular, since, you know, we're, this is the ng-conf webinar, the exactly. fact of the matter is it is the whole thing, including hosting. Right. So mm -hmm. there are um, things that we need to consider um, or things that people, if you aren't part of a group that has a whole like SRE team that can handle that, it's something that we will have to make sure that we're handling in our um server web server setup right configuring it correctly making sure that people don't have access that they should make sure that you're using least privilege like all these sort of principles we do need to apply that and mm -hmm. you are absolutely right sometimes these decision makers are people who don't have that um that technical know-how or that that uh, uh keeping up with these practices as a matter of fact the um the new category for the oasp uh top 10 for 2021 includes recognition of that. And it's called insecure design. It's mm. that we starting off at an insecure spot, right? Because we're mm. not stepping back far enough within that uh, thought process to uh, make sure that we have security built in, much less getting to the hosting, once we get to the hosting side. It's like it starts from the very, very beginning, from those decision makers, from those requirements, as well as all the way through the uh, mm -hmm. the production um, hosting process. All right, I have one last for you. I'm, I'm, I I know I, I have so much more for you, but I'm just gonna be like uh, uh, very uh, cognizant of you know the time and uh, um, uh, you being under the weather today. But the thing is, I know that we are kind of angular focus, but at a certain level, we are we are we are like playing on the whole stack if you were today to like pull out the npm packages that we are we depend on you know most of us our life will be over but <laughs> you know we have all of these packages that we kind of depend on and most of the time that we just like add to our code base without even thinking about it um is there a one-on-one -on -one strategy about like just light auditing like at the security level before even like uh, um, getting it into like, uh, can we turn those into a policy? How, what is what is your take on it? If you were just to like, hey, you are a junior developer, you're coming in. If you're gonna be security conscious, this is how you deal with packages, or this is how you deal with you know outside code. What what would be your take on that? Yeah, so you know, I actually wanted to spend more time on that mm -hmm. in the uh, in my presentation, but unfortunately, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, could, I really could talk all day. The, here's the thing to think about when you have uh, packages and dependencies, right? One, like just a good rule of thumb, you want to make sure that they are common packages that are well-maintained, right? Because if they're not well-maintained or they're uncommon, the chances are um, it's going to be maybe not as, it might be more vulnerable, right? Or it might not get fixed as quickly mm -hmm. if there is a problem. So like at a high level, that's that's one criteria to apply. Another thing you could do is um, you could use like, uh, if you use NPM, for example, you can run NPM audit and mm -hmm. check out if there, if that dependency or any of its dependencies 
has any security vulnerabilities, right? So I recommend doing that uh, once you get through that threshold of making sure it's common, well-maintained um, library. Mm -hmm. When you include that within your application, some things to keep in mind is make sure that you're pinning the version. What you don't want to do is to have ah. a, uh, yeah, you want to make sure you generate a lock file, mm -hmm. which I, NPM normally does. But, yeah, with the package.lock, uh, yeah. With the package.lock, right. But mm -hmm. I think this is something that most people don't do, is that anytime you're using, you're installing your dependencies, especially in your CI/CD process, you want to use NPM CI, not NPM I. Mm -hmm. Because NPM CI I just is found out about that. Yeah. I was like, why this is not common knowledge? Right. You know? it, so, it's yeah. really new. I mean, new uh -huh. it's, it's a few years old, but it's it's not, it's, you know, NPM install came first. And NPM install will automatically update your packages to Ooh. the greatest version that's allowed in Simber. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do that. You want to use the exact version that you checked against previously in that lock file. So you want to use NPM CI. Additionally, you probably want to limit the range of your Sember. You might want to consider using exact. Right. Mm -hmm. So another uh, vulnerability that uh, like I didn't talk about this time was colors. What that came out in 2021 as well. Right. Um, where the maintainer pushed out a patch change that actually was malicious and caused problems. And uh, frameworks that depended on it then had issues, right? If they had used exact, exact uh, um, uh, versions, then they wouldn't have ran into this problem because they wouldn't have automatically taken, up, taken that patch update. So just some things to think about in terms of making sure that you're locking and pinning your dependencies properly. Wow. Package management and strategy, policies around that, how do you update? I think that's a whole other talk by itself, but mm -hmm. we need that kind of education like, you know, um, around the community. We'll take that for another time. And Alisa, I can only say once again, thank you so much for being so wonderful and like, yes, guys, I'm sorry, being one of my like favorite, most favorite uh, speakers. So, and you see why she's thorough. She, co she covered a lot of complex topics, but it was very easy to follow. Thank you for doing that and best to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Thank you everybody who joined and don't forget ng-conf is happening again in Utah, uh, June. And uh, I always mess it up. 12 and 13 are the workshop. The 14th will be like the conference. Everybody that you love in the Angular community will be there. Please don't miss it. Until next time. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye.